Hello everyone. Let's start with a new subject that is strength of materials and we also know it as so. So what we are trying to learn with this subject here as the name itself suggests we are trying to find out strength of a particular material. So in case of civil engineering we use steel and RCC as our construction material mostly. So before we can use these materials for construction we have to be sure about how much load this material can resist. Now how do we understand that? So when we apply some external load on the material some resisting forces resisting forces develop inside the material and these resisting forces will help us I mean I mean these are the forces that resist this external load so with this subject we are trying to understand what are these resisting forces so let's start with it let's say there is, there is this block and we apply load P in the opposite directions so this block will remain in equilibrium now let's say we take a section here a vertical section so both of these sections should be in equilibrium so there is this load P so to balance this load P there should be an equal and opposite load so let's say that load is R and similarly on this right side section there is this load P so there is there will be a resisting force that is R so this resisting force is being developed inside the material due to what due to due to the presence of an external external force so if we take this resisting force and we divide it by the cross sectional area we get a term that we know as stress so we later understand why we prefer stress instead of using the resisting force directly for now just remember the definition now let's say for the same block we take another section which is inclined now on this inclined section again there is this load P so there will be an opposite I mean resisting force R but this R will have two components if we talk about I mean if we talk with respect to this surface here so there will be a component which is perpendicular to the surface there will be a component which is parallel to the surface so if we again find out the stress in this case so we get two types of stresses here one is normal stress and another one that is parallel to the surface it is known as shear stress we'll understand more about these stresses later so normal stress can be of two types it can be tensile or it can be compressive that we'll see later now after stress there is another thing that is known as strain now because we apply this load so if this load is sufficiently large there will be some deformation so there is another term that is defined that is strain which is defined as change in length that is delta L that is say divided by original length so it will be a unitless quantity unitless quantity so if change in length is very small then we use del by L or it can also be differentiation of these terms for accurate measurements now there comes a curve that is known as stress strain curve so as I told earlier that we use 
the stress instead of resisting force and similarly we use strain instead of deformation so what is the benefit so let's say if we measure resisting force and deformation i mean what will be the deformation for a particular load so that load and deformation will depend upon the size and shape of the of the material whereas if we use if we use stress and strain stress strain it will be independent of the size and shape of the of the material so instead of plotting a load deformation curve we plot stress strain curve because it will remain it will remain same irrespective of the size and shape of the material so it is a characteristic property of the material so here we'll try to understand stress strain curve for mild steel so to obtain the stress strain curve a prismatic bar is taken that is prismatic means the bar of constant cross sectional area so the cross sectional area of this bar remains same throughout its length so let's say for this length we are measuring the stress strain this is l not l not is the gauge length and the cross sectional area initial cross sectional area let's say is a not so stress which is denoted with sigma is defined as the load divided by initial cross sectional area and strain which is denoted with epsilon it is the change in length divided by initial length so with this stress and strain the plot i mean this stress strain curve is plotted so this specimen is tested in the universal testing machine and this is a type this is the curve what we get for mild steel now this curve has different parts so let's understand that so initially we have this straight line portion that is oa which is known as the proportional proportional limit in this zone the stress is linearly proportional to strain which means if we take the ratio stress divided by strain we get a constant of proportionality so this constant of proportionality is known as modulus of elasticity which is denoted with e so this modulus of elasticity it is a characteristic property of the material it will be same even if we i mean even if we change the dia i mean say size and shape of this material so this modulus of elasticity will remain same so in this zone stress is linearly proportional to strain which is nothing but your hooks law as well hooks law now after this point a we have another point b which defines our elastic limit so in this i mean what the elastic what this elastic limit means that is if we unload this specimen at this point b so unloading curve will be b a o that is no permanent deformation will take place in this specimen so that is the significance of this elastic limit but the stress is not linearly proportional to strain it is proportional but not linearly now after this point b we reach i mean when we further increase the load we reach this point c which is known as 
upper yield point so this upper yield point it is a transient state transient state and after this upper yield point we go to the next point that is d that is your lower yield point so what is upper yield point and lower yield point so upper yield point is the load just before just before the yielding starts that's why we call it as the transient point it is just before the yielding start and lower yielding i mean lower yield point is the actual point of actual point at which at which yield will take place so for the practical purposes these two points are taken same because this little dip here it depends upon the method of loading and other things so for the practical purposes these two points are taken same but yield limit is defined with this point d for a particular material i mean in this case for mild steel the yielding point is defined with d so after this point d we have this zone d e here what is happening here the here the strain is increasing at a rapid rate compared to the load or we can say compared to the stress so here this is the plastic zone for this mild steel because it's a ductile material so here the strain is or the rate of strain is very high now after this point e we have this zone ef which is known as strain hardening zone so again after this point e the strain does not increase like this it where it was increasing i mean how it was increasing before so in this zone we have to apply further load to get some strain in this material so here the stress is again increasing so this point f corresponds to the ultimate stress of the material so why this strain hardening takes place strain hardening takes place due to due to the change in crystalline structure of the material so that is about this point this part ef and after that in the part fg the the stress we can say we have to apply lesser stress and the strain will keep on increasing and at this point g the specimen specimen will break so after this point f what happens the cross sectional area cross sectional area of the specimen starts to reduce and this phenomenon we know as necking and at this point g finally the specimen breaks so when the specimen breaks i mean this mild steel specimen breaks it breaks something like this so this type of failure is known as cup cone failure so this angle here it will be 45 degrees so it has a greater significance which is related to the shear stresses and that we'll understand when we under, when we'll cover the theories of failure for now you can just remember that the mild steel fails as the in the cup cone failure when we when we talk about the tensile stress strain stress strain curve so that is the stre tensile stress strain curve for mild steel now this curve 
has some limitations or we can say some basic conditions which are required so the curve will be affected by the temperature of the specimen rate of loading so when the static loading is there this curve will remain like this but in case of dynamic loading the curve will be different manufacturing process how the steel is manufactured and one more thing that is if the specimen specimen is loaded for the first time or it is being reloaded that will also affect this stress strain curve and after that let's see a little about the stress strain curve for mild steel in compression so this stress strain curve for mild steel in compression it remains same same as the strain strain curve in tension but it happens up to a limit so it will be same up to this yielding yielding and strain hardening part strain hardening part and if we further increase the stresses further increase stress then this curve will vary because in case of i mean in this case there will be no necking so the for higher stresses the curve is different we can conclude here that higher for higher stresses the stress strain curve is different stress strain curve in compression is different than the stress strain curve in tension after that we can see for some other materials so here we saw in case of mild steel we have a definite yield point that is somehow we can clearly see where the yield is taking place but that does not happen for every material like for aluminium and copper this let's say for aluminium this curve remains something like this now in this case in this case we don't know where the yield is where yield is taking place so to find out i mean to define the strength of the material we define a particular strain that is we i have not drawn it very well so it is something like this so this initial line is linear so we draw a parallel i mean a line which is parallel to this initial line and we draw it such that the strain is 0.2% here so correspondingly the stress what we get, what we get this is your stress strain and this is your stress so correspondingly what the stress what we get this this is used for the i mean for the design purposes and this stress here it is known as the proof stress corresponding to corresponding to 0.2% strain 0.2% strain means nothing but 0.002 the value of strain is 0.002 so here this proof stress is not a it is not a property or characteristic property of the material because here we can see that this point 2 is we are defining this point 2 this is not happening by itself so this is not a characteristic property of the material so these are some of the basic things later we'll see in more details some of these things so thank you for this one